Hello, and welcome to our weekly Sunday morning service at Woodlawn Baptist Church in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. We hope you're blessed with this message. Now let's read this. The Word of God. Uh, if you have the Pew Bible, it's page 940. I know, it's even still Old Testament, way back there, yeah. Okay. Here we go. Then the angel who talked with me returned and wakened me. As a man is wakened from his sleep, he asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? He answered, Do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who despises the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. And then in parentheses it adds, these seven are the eyes of the Lord which range throughout the earth. Lord, take your word, O oh God, and make it real to us in a, in a new and wonderful way. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would empower Pastor Gary as he comes to share, but also will empower us to not just be hearers of the word of God, but doers of the word. Lord Jesus, may you be glorified in all of it, we pray. In your name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Gary. I'm right here. Hey. All right. Good to see you. Welcome. All right. Great to be here. So before I speak, I have another speaker who's going to come and give a testimony. My daughter, Lauren. She, Mana, she's my youngest daughter. I have five daughters. Wow. So, any questions about women, just ask me. <laughs> I've experienced it all. But, born after her was my one and only son, Josiah. So she's not the youngest. In her mind, she's the youngest. But, uh, but Lauren has been, uh, she graduated public school and she brought one of her friends, Evelina. And Evelina is now in Greece doing mission work. Her and Evelina went last year for a year and a half to Word of Life Bible College in Argentina. And then she's recently been to Greece uh, doing mission work, street ministry, and she's leaving again this August. Uh, she's been ex accepted into Moody Flight School. And so you worry about your kids driving? How about worry about your kids flying? So, Lauren, come give a question. Good morning. <laughs> um, great to be with you all this morning. So as my dad mentioned that I was able to study a year and a half in Word of Life Argentina. It is a Bible institute and there, I did a bilingual program so I was able to learn Spanish and also just see a whole new culture but also see God through the eyes of a whole different culture. So it was really cool because um, I don't know if you guys know this, but my parents were missionaries in Romania for 20 years. So I grew up in the mission field already. So sometimes, I don't know how many of you will um, identify with this, but sometimes when you grow up in a Christian family or you grow up in a missionary family, you think you know everything. So you don't really think you need to go to Bible school or you need to do all these things, you know? You think you're good. 
So when my friend encouraged me after COVID to go to Argentina, Word of Life, to study a year, I was like, um, I don't, <laughs> I don't really see why I need to do that, you know? So in my head, I really fought with it because I was thinking, God, I feel like you have a plan for my life. Why would I go to Argentina? It would just take longer, you know? And I found that, I found myself thinking, okay, I'll go to Argentina, I'll stay the year, and I'll learn Spanish, you know? It'll be, it'll be good, I'll have more opportunities to go out in the world. So I don't know if my main focus was the Bible classes, but once I got there, um, God put the verse Ezekiel 36, 26 in my heart, and he just showed me that I had so much in my life that he needed to change before I was, he was going to be able to use me. So he needed to use that year in Argentina to really just change my perspective, to change my heart on these things that maybe I was said and thinking, okay, God, I'm going to give you a year of my life, right? And God showed me that my whole life is his, so I can't just give one year. So in Argentina, we were able to do so many missions trips, so many activities, street evangelizing. I learned so many new things from the Bible that I was like, wow, this says this in the Bible. I didn't even know that. And God just transformed my heart. He transformed my stony, stubborn heart, and he gave me a tender, responsive heart, a heart that said, I can't keep worrying about my own life, my own desires, my own plans, right? I have to follow God, follow what he has for my life because it's so much more rewarding. And ultimately, there is a whole world that is lost, a whole world that is perishing, right? This world is fading away and the only things that will last are the things that we do for God, right? Mm. That we're gonna be able to go before the feet of Jesus and give him these things and give him these crowns and say, look what you used me to do. This is for your glory, it's not for our own glory. And it changed my life to think that I can't live for myself anymore. It's not, it's not my life, it's his. So whatever he will use me with, that it will be amazing. I was blessed to be raised in a family where I knew this, but there's a lot of people who don't have this, who are raised in a family that know this. And if God could use me to reach anyone, just even one person, that would be one soul, because an eternity, right? An eternity is forever, so. That is <laughs> what I hope to do once I go to Washington is to become a missionary pilot, to reach the ends of the earth where they have no access to the gospel and there's no one who goes there. So thank you for <laughs> listening to me this morning. <laughs>job considering I asked you to give a testimony on the ride up here so <laughs> but that was to cut it down right at the time but anyways so great to be here uh, I've been your pastor and of course uh, Nick and Jen have been at Black, uh, Faith Baptist Church since we uh, do you guys remember us when we were missionaries so we were missionaries in Romania before that and God worked uh, for us to come to Faith Baptist and actually uh, take the church as pastor. So that's been a tremendous blessing. Uh, God has been really good. I'll tell you a little bit about that in the message. But what I really want to do this morning is I want to encourage you guys this morning because we live in a world that always likes to emphasis, emphasize the big things, right? And, and you know, when you... When you talk to, when you go to a pastor's meeting, they'll they always ask, well, how many are you running? And, I, and I'll say, well, yeah, I'm running a lot out of the church. No. Uh, but, but that's not really a comparison. God wants us to win, reach people. God doesn't look on the numbers. God is a God that works often and mainly through the small things. And so the first we have that we're going to, uh, I'm going to skip these pictures, but I'm going to go here. He said to Zerubbabel, for who has despised the day of small things? Or who has, who has looked with disdain 
on the small beginnings. Who has looked at something and said, oh, that's just a small group, that's just a little group, that's, that's, there's not a lot of rich people there, there's not a lot of smart people, although you guys look like very smart people. A couple of you, maybe, uh, this morning. Uh, but God works, he says, who has despised what God is doing in the lives of people? You just never know what God is going to do. Now, my wife is from Woonsocket. Can any good thing come out of Woonsocket? <laughs> yeah. Right? Most of you saying, I didn't, I didn't believe it, but I heard it today for the first time. Something good came out of Woonsocket. My wife was saved through the bus ministry at the age of 13. And so the church there, Blackstone Valley, uh, they had bought an old building like this. A pastor came from Oklahoma, started a church, started running buses. Her whole family came, and she, at the age of 13, uh, went to Christian school, surrendered to go to the mission field. And uh, when she met me, I wasn't thinking of the mission field, uh, but in 1992, shortly after the fall of communism, communism uh, a Romanian family came to our church. I visited Romania in 1992. And this is the picture on the balcony in 1994 when we first went to Romania. It, you see, I only had one child then, out of six. And so we had a fruitful ministry in Romania. Uh, and this is 2013 when we turned the church over to a national pastor. We we started a few works. Uh, we were in the city of Constanza. It was the main city. and uh, But God uh, blessed the church. We were able to build the church and leave it in the hands of a national pastor. We were home on furlough. We were uh, planning on going back to Romania. That was my goal. We were going to go to the city of Uzo and start another church. Uh, but God had other plans for us. He brought us to Faith Baptist Church in Enfield, Connecticut. And he had a work for us to do it, do there, which, which we're going to talk a little bit at the end, but it's probably similar to what we're doing here uh, at your church. But if you think about this verse, right? He said, who has despised the day of small beginnings? Now let me explain the context what this verse means. And then we'll look how we can apply it in our own lives. But the verse starts with the rebuilding of the temple that was destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem. Solomon built a beautiful temple. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. But Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed the temple. They were in captivity for seven year, 70 years. Excuse me. They were spread out. A lot of them were in Babylon. Uh, there was a remnant left in the Holy Land. And the king of Persia, okay, wait a minute, let me get to the next verse, okay? The king of Persia, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, king Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now think about this. Cyrus is a pagan king. Cyrus, Persian king, they had conquered the known world. But God's people were still a witness. They still remembered the cross in the Red Sea. They still remembered David. They still remembered Solomon. They still remembered the temple. And God put it in the heart of Cyrus. Okay? To give a decree to gather up a remnant of the people to go back into the land and rebuild the temple. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. A lot of our lives are spent rebuilding. Think about that. How many of you have ever renovated a house? You bought a house and renovated Anybody here? Okay. It's a lot of work, right? And you wish, man, I wish they would have made these walls straight. Yeah. <laughs> That's 
especially houses here in New England. Some of these go back to the 1700s, 1800s, and uh, it's a lot of work, right? But maybe some of you renovated a house 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and what are you doing now? You're renovating it again. And so a lot of times this, this happens in churches. Churches go up and down. Churches sometimes have peak days and then sometimes people move away or a pastor changes or something happens. The, the community around changes and then it goes down and then there's a time of rebuilding, right? There's, there's in, and even in our personal lives, right? There's times when we're on fire for God. There's times where we're just going through the motions and not feeling it, and we have to rebuild our lives, right? We have to get back in the Bible, get back in the devotions, and, 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 and get God to, to rework in our lives. So we're, we're always doing this rebuilding in our lives. And so they went back, they laid the foundations of the temple, okay? This verse, but many of the older priests. So, so what happened is they laid the foundation of the older temple, and the young people, man, they, were, they were partying up, and this is awesome. And the older people were weeping. They were sad. The Bible says this, but many older priests, Levites and other leaders who had seen, what, the first temple, wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. So uh, some were happy, some were upset because they had seen the former glory. And they said, it's not the same. And it's kind of a, just a, a little thought here. Never compare, never compare to the past. Never compare to the past. Never no look at the past. And we do this in churches. We, you know, for older people do. I have my mother-in-law. She, all she talks about is the 50s. You know, I'm living for 2024. I'm not living for 1994 when I went to Romania. I'm not living for the... Oh, I was around in the 50s, so I can't live for the 50s. But I'm living... Today is 2024. July... No, June 9th. Okay? This is the day I'm living in. This is the time I'm living. When I came... I can remember coming to... When I first came to Faith Baptist Church. And... And, uh... You know, we had similar... Uh, you know, it was an older congregation and they'd been through a lot, very traditional. And I taught a couple of lessons on culture. And I said to them this, I said, if you want to do church like it's always been done, and Tom knows, we have a big building. They had a school at one time. It was like a 300-seat auditorium. I said, if you want to do things the way they've always been done, let's sell the building, buy a small little chapel, and live out our days. Because when I went to Romania, I built a Romanian church, not an American church. And the culture was totally different in Romania. I had to learn another language, another culture. But you know what? The culture is totally different now. What you grew up with, and we say this, right? It's not like it used to be. And it used to be this, and it used to be that. So what? Who cares? We can never bemoan the past. So that's what these people were doing. But they had laid the foundation now, what had happened is, of course, whenever God starts working, Satan wants to work. He's going to bring division. He's going to bring problems. And so they had a whole bunch of problems. I'll get into that. And so the work of the temple, Ezra chapter 4, verse 24. So the work of the temple of God in Jerusalem had stopped. And it remained at a standstill until the second year of reign of King Darius. Purchase. So what had happened? If you read Haggai, and if you read Nehemiah, and Ezra, there's a few things that happened. Uh, first of all, they were struggling financially. They were struggling financially because they were in the land. They weren't in the power. They weren't they, under King Solomon reign. They had all the money. They didn't have any money. So they were struggling financially. They had lost their priorities. And Haggai said this. He says, look, you guys, you have plenty of time to build your houses, but you don't have enough time to build the house of God. Here's another thing we say all the time. We don't have enough time. 
Yeah. Have you ever said that? Sure. Yeah. I don't have enough time. You have the same time you've always had. Do we only have 23 and a half hours now? Is that it? <laughs> only 22 hours? Feels like it. Feels like it. Feels like it. We have the same time. So here's the priority. They lost their pride. And then their enemies were constantly impressing them. When the enemies heard what Judah was doing, they came to the king and they, they got the work stopped. They got a law passed. They got a decree given because they didn't want God's work to go forth. And so when we begin to rebuild the work of God or build the work of God or do the work of the church, it's a spiritual battle. <coughs> I don't... Listen, there are some Sundays I don't want to preach. Amen, Pastor? Some Sundays... It's like, what well, is a spiritual battle? You know, the, the best time on Sunday is after church. Okay. All right? Let the sermon out. See if it went good or not. Don't know, but... Uh, so, so they had lost their priorities. They had been overcome by enemies, problems, financial problems. And so the work stopped. You know how long it stopped? 20 years. 20 years till we come to this message in Zechariah, which we've read. This message he gave to Zerubbabel, 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 thank you, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was not a pastor, he was not a preacher, he was a governor, he was a political leader, okay? Ezra was the priest, Zechariah was a prophet, and so they had other messages there. But he came to Zerubbabel and he came to encourage him to continue to do the work of the Lord. I think Lauren said it pretty clearly uh, this morning. Of all the things that we can do of life and all that we can spend our time and money on, what is eternal? What is eternal? And one of the reasons why we come to, we don't have time because we spend our time in so many other things. And so he had come to him and he was encouraging him and he was just saying, look, guys, this is, the, this is serious. This is God's work. Don't lose your passion. Don't lose your vision for what I'm doing. And so the first, let me give three points and some examples, conclusions. But the first thing he said is God's power is enough and sufficient. You have Everything you need to do the work of God right now. You have. Notice what he said. You've probably heard this verse, right? So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. What does he say? Not by might, not by power. So what is he talking about? He's probably talking about political power because they're not, you know, they're not departing in power. They're a minority. They're despised. There's people that want to eliminate them. They don't have a lot of money. Not a lot of resources. And so from a pure human perspective, they didn't have the power to do the work of God. And maybe today is that we... And I struggle with this. We all struggle with this. I don't need God. I can do this. You ever do that? I got it. I mean, God's busy. He's got, like, the weaker people to take care of. No, he's saying, no, but God's work is not going to be done by our power. Not through our power. Through His power. He says, not by might nor by power. He says, but by what? My spirit. My, is my time up? Was that? <laughs> Listen, I'm just getting started. This is like, uh, I don't get here too often, though. Just kidding. Uh, he said, but my, my spirit. There's only one way a person can be converted and transformed to the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, we've made a lot of our 
converts in evangelical churches, haven't we? We've, we've made them say a prayer, we've done all this, and we say, why aren't they here? Well, there are converts, our gods. The only person that can save anybody is, is God. Amen. Now, we water, we sow, we tell the soil, take out the weeds, but only God gives the increase. So when people come to Christ and the church begins to grow, who gets the glory? God gets the glory. But, but on the other hand, we get, listen, do not be intimidated by the facade of the world. Because people can give a facade that they don't need God and they're all set, but down deep in their heart, God may be working. God may be working. God may be there. We've seen testimony a couple weeks ago. Luke and Rena, they were agnostics. They weren't care about church. Didn't know anything about the Bible. My testimony, 17, I came to Christ through the radio. This is J. Vernon McGee. I had no clue about the Bible. We live in a culture, in this culture, in this area, people know nothing about the Bible. They don't know anything. And we can sit there and we can criticize the culture, criticize people. Well, you know, guys are not Christians. They don't even know what a Bible is. Their, own, their idea of Christianity is what movies portray. Some fanatic. Some mean person. The big black Bible, right? And he's never happy. That's their only thought, right? But the Word of God is quick and powerful. Transforms. Changes people. That's what we have to hang our hat on. That's what we have to say, no, the Word of God. And then... God can demolish any mountain. Any mountain can be demolished. He kind of gives this verse, right? He says, who are you, O great mountain? And that's the better. We're like, this mountain's so high. Anybody climb Mount Mananak? <laughs> Nobody? Yeah, a few of you. Mount Tom, that's where we, Mount Tom's where in Holyoke where we are. Uh, I've climbed Mount Sinai and in Romania, and uh, when you stand at the foot of a, of a mountain, it's intimidating, isn't it? It's intimidating. And you say, how am I going to, I would do this at camp. You guys are going to World Life. You, you've never been to camp, so you've been to camp in Romania. We went to this random camp, and I would take the kids on a hike in the woods, no path. No, like little trail sign. Just there's the mountain we're gonna get to. Like halfway up, all the kids are crying. They're gonna die, and they're dying of thirst. And, and I'm pushing them and pushing them. Finally, we make it. They're all excited. We made it to the top of the mountain. But God's saying here, look, who are you? Who's who? Like obstacles are gonna stop us. So the king gave a decree. So you don't have enough money. <clears throat> Listen, this is my work. He says, <clears throat> before Zerubbabel, you shall be a what? Plain. You should be a plain. Now, in back of our house, I don't know what they're doing, but they made this big, huge pile, pile, pile of dirt. I don't know if they've been selling it. I don't know if they're making, I heard they're making a the tobacco farm. Looks like they're making development. I'm not sure. But day after day, they've been grinding this <coughs> dirt up and getting us. It was a big pot, and I was almost down. It's taking a long time, but that wasn't even a month. Listen, the obstacles that we face are opportunities to see the power of God. <coughs> if we look at the obstacles, we'll never do anything. You look at God, He says it's going to be a plane. And then, the next thing, God wants to use your hands. He wants to use your hands. Notice what he said. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hand of 
Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple, his hand shall also what? Finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So he's not, he's not asking you to find someone else to finish it. He's asking you. So all of us here in this room this morning, God wants to use your hands, your feet, your arms, your legs, your brain, for those that have one. I'm trying to keep you guys awake this morning. This is different than our churches. I can look this one. I can look all around. Yeah. Should be on one of these spinning wheels. I can spin around, right? So, I like to look at people's eyes, make sure they're not sleeping. Unless you're Mr. Cleveland. We have Mr. Cleveland, he sleeps every sermon. I, I know it's a really good sermon if Mr. Cleveland's still awake after 10 minutes. Uh, but he wants to use your hand. He wants to use you. And if we believe in the power of the gospel, we don't, we're not, <clears throat> listen, we're not held back by the culture, the times, the society. God wants to use you to work, do His work. There are people everywhere that need Christ. There are people around this church they don't know Jesus. Don't know anything about Him. Walk by this church. Don't even care. Don't even know what it is. And you know what I noticed about the younger generation? They're not against. They don't know. They don't know. So He wants to use your hands. He wants to use you. And so... When we went to Romania, I can remember uh, this picture here. Okay, this is when we first started the church. This is at the uh, at our apartment building, and uh, we're going to meet Thursday. Uh, Johnny, the the little boy in the middle, Johnny's coming. Elena, she's not going to be but her two kids are going to come, our two Romanian grandkids are going to come to the wedding. Uh, and I, I can remember we had another missionary working with us, and, and he, he made a comment one time. My wife never forgets these comments, but he said, well, you just got a bunch of kids in the church, just a bunch of kids. Like, we didn't have any doctors or lawyers back then. We didn't have any, you know, real important people. We just had a bunch of, you know, a handful of kids, right? On the left, Veronica, uh, she's still serving in the church in Newcastle, England. Uh, married a godly man who's one of the deacons. Uh, her mother and father, her dad, John, <coughs> was a boxer, came to Christ, and still on fire for God. Uh, Johnny and Elena, Elena's is over uh, is a teacher over 300 teachers at there's a Romanian church right outside of London with over a thousand members and her and her husband are involved in that Johnny's uh, has three children he, he pastored right now he's in school but here's the thing so so who's despised the small beginnings Who's despised a couple of kids that were on the street half the time because their father was a drunk and their mother was in Greece doing prostitution? And who despised the kids that came to the church and they didn't have any money to put in the play factory? We taught them what peanut butter was. And they learned to love peanut because they didn't have peanut butter in Romania. Anytime anybody came from the States, they'd bring, what do you, we didn't need to bring peanut butter. They love peanut butter and jelly. But the gospel changed. The gospel, who's despised the small things? Who says that, that, that a vacation Bible school has just a few kids 
You don't know. You're going to judge? Does God know? <clears throat> where does it begin? You don't know where it's going to begin. This is uh, the next slide. This is Fanny. And Fanny <coughs> was, is, I don't say was, still a gypsy. Uh, and when he came to church, I can remember he was in the trolley bus and he was hiding because there was a guy on the trolley bus that he had stabbed one time. And he read one of those tracks, little track, chick tracks, one of those chick tracks. Mm -hmm. This was your life. Oh, yeah. And he was reading that. He said the word of God just spoke to his heart, came to Christ. I remember the first time they lived then. <clears throat> we went to visit him then. They lived in a room. <coughs> Not an apartment, a room. Like a room. Like probably about as big as from here to the platform. They had their, probably even small, they had their bed, two little kids, little stove for cooking. Uh, the bathroom was an outhouse. The water was a was a faucet in the, in the yard. And when they put the food up down, it was one plate. And we all got a fork. But you know, when I, when my wife and I sat there and ate with them, of course, you know, we were the Americans. He, it, this is, if I start telling Romanian stories, we'll be here all day, so I will not tell that one. But they were excited to see Americans. And so, uh, Fanny, uh, Luminita learned to read, uh, read the Bible. All their kids went through college and university. That's their youngest child. Marius was there. That's the church in, uh, right there, uh, Holy Trinity Church in Newcastle, England, because a lot of, most of our church from Romania moved to Newcastle, and they're still serving the church. Marius is serving the church, Dina. But who, you know, gypsies were pretty much despised. Who's despised the small beginnings? You don't know. You don't know, that's last Sunday at our church, the one of Sunday. One of Sundays at Big DC, Nick's there, and Jen helps out. And when we first came to faith, and Jen, we were talking about that, the only children in the church were Kiana, Rachel, uh, Jessica, and Emma. Emma's my favorite teenager in the church, I tell her that all the time. But that was it. We didn't have a nursery. We didn't have a junior church. And I can remember. I can remember. We talked about the Flemings. I remember trying to convince them to come to church because we don't have anything for the kids. And the first day they said they were coming, I said to my wife, I said, we're starting junior church today. I mean, in other words, you're starting junior church today, right? And we just started. We renovated those rooms. And started, and I can remember, boy, it was so hard. You had a family with kids come to church, and you're like telling them, oh, we're going to have kids. We, we got it started, right? And, but you don't give up. You start, all right, we got to adapt. We got to reach the young next generation. And now we've had to split the junior church into two kids. This year we had our best Awana year ever. And but it takes a lot of work. Wednesday nights we're exhausted. We're glad Wednesday nights over for the summer, right? We only do it uh, from September to May. And every Wednesday night, it's, oh. But then you see the kids, and they come in and they say their verses, and you see God working, and you hear the testimonies, and you don't know what God's going to do with any of those children. But through those children, we have families now. Right? Never despise the small beginnings. And you can look at this church and say, look, the demographics have changed, whatever's changed. Listen, one kid, one child that you bring to this church, 
could be the next missionary you send out of church. You don't know. You don't know. The work of God is uh, so often done in the little things, the humble things, the weak things. Who are we to judge what God is doing in our lives? One more, one more, uh, I'll close with Connie. Now, Connie, we started a work in this village of Biruinsa. Biruinsa means victory. And it's a village of about 250 people. We ended up finding a place there uh, for camps and stuff. We started a small little church there. Uh, most of the time they would come into the main church in Constanza. And this girl Connie, her and her three sisters, their mother and father were always having problems. Uh, they were giving them gifts for Christmas. And uh, there's their mother and the three children. And then uh, there's Connie. So, so three of the girls, I'm trying to think, the oldest is married now. She's serving God. But we were there this summer. When I was there in Romania this summer, we ran into Connie. Didn't know that this had happened. Didn't know what was going on. But God had worked in her lives, her life. And she had surrendered and already been in Iraq as a missionary. And she's going back now. I just got a letter from her. She's going back next week. And uh, our church started supporting her. But here's a village of 250 people in Romania. Not much happened in there. We didn't have great crowds. And we had kids through the years that we ministered to. The church was never a big, it's never a big church. But here's a girl who's given her life. And she said in her testimony that when I was a kid, people would come and they'd do vacation Bible school and do camps and tell me about Jesus. And she says, I want to do that now for other kids and other children and tell them about Jesus. And so she's going back to learn Arabic and to minister there in Iraq. The day of small things. The day of small things. You don't know. See, see this thing about rebuilding. You notice what God never says. God never says, well, yeah, I know you have the enemies and it's hard. Yeah, I can see why you stopped. He never... <laughs> he never gives weight to the excuses or the problems or the difficulties. He said, wait a minute. You have my spirit. That's all you need. He says, this mountain... Flat. Your hand, Zerubbabel, maybe you want to, maybe Zerubbabel wants to turn it over. We've got to find a younger person. Guy <coughs> mm -hmm. said, no. Honey, it's your hand. You started it, Zerubbabel. I'm going to use you to finish it. So well, I can't. Maybe. Maybe when he gets you to the place where you say, I can't, maybe that's the beginning of where God's going to work. Because it's not by might, not by power, it's by the Spirit of God. It's by God's Spirit. I had a pastor one time from Fall River, Dave Berg, and he, he said this, <clears throat> He said, I used to pray. We pray for a lot of people, right? He said, I'm praying for one. I'm praying for one. One person. Because he said through one particular lady in her ch his church, she brought in like 30 people. And I was praying for the one. 
right? You know who the one is? Do you know, Nick, who the one is? Andy, through homeschool. We started having homeschool in our gym. We had about six families in our church now because of homeschool. Through one person. Starting a homeschool group. I didn't have anything to do with that. Nothing to do with me. Pray for the one. Pray God will give you one. One new face to bring in people. Because God has a work to do. God has his church here. God started, okay, Faith Baptist. I think their highest attendance at one time was 700. It took us going on eight years. It took us eight years. Finally, last season, we finally broke 200 on Easter Sunday. But it took a long time. It took a long time. It takes time. It takes work. It takes faithful people like Nick and Jen to be there every week and involved in Awana and involved in the church and not giving up and continuing and working. That's what it takes. And yeah, we get discouraged and yeah, the times are difficult. I understand that. But don't look down on the small beginnings God is doing. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this message to Zerubbabel. And Lord, we need it. We need it every day. We need this message all the time. Because it is not always easy, but Lord, it is a blessing. When we see people baptized, see people come to know you, see lives transformed. I pray for Pastor Tom, I pray for the deacons, I pray for all the people involved. They would strengthen their hands to do your work. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you'd like more information about anything you heard today or to inquire about online giving, you can reach us online at www.woodlawnri.org or meet with us on Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. at 337 Lonsdale Avenue in Pawtucket. May God richly bless you.